Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 this morning. I'm just going to start off reading one verse to you. A well-known verse of the Bible. But it says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how He said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. More blessed to give than to receive. We've all heard that before, and it is true. Uh, you know, kids don't always think of it that way. They like receiving. You know, you know, Christmas is all something that's coming up. They're always excited about receiving those gifts. But you know what? As a parent, it's fun giving the gifts too. I enjoy. Uh, I've always enjoyed Christmas, even as an adult, and buying the presents for our kids. It's always been. A lot of fun when we first started having kids, you know, we were anxious to do the presents, but you know, they're just babies, they don't really care. And then finally, when they started getting to the age where they could care a little bit, I think uh, Tommy was two and Jason was one. And I remember we were, we were kind of excited about Christmas that year. And but unfortunately, they were like sick that day. And so they were like miserable opening the presents and it was it was no fun. And so, you know, then the next year, finally, everybody was healthy. And it, it, it is, it's fun. It's fun giving. Giving is. Something that we enjoy, and, you know, and in churches today, there's you, know, you can put people in three different categories. There's you know the givers, there's the takers, but then the third one is what I want to talk. I want to talk about, and I want to speak against today, and that's investors. There's givers, takers, and investors. There's some people they come to church. What does this church have to offer me? You know, what kind of fun stuff do you have here? You know that we call them the Chuck E. Cheese Fun Center churches. That's what they're looking for. You know, I mean, you know, what kind of fun stuff? Do you have for the kids, you know, do you have uh, an amusement park and merry-go-rounds and, you know, how fun is the service? You know, what's your music like in the church? Do you have a band and a praise team? And they want to come and they want to get entertained is what they're looking for. They're not looking for preaching from the word of God. And I learned real quick after we started this church that, you know what? I can't compete with the Chuck E. Cheese Fun Centers. I, I, I can't do it. I haven't got the personality for it. And I, we've never had the money for it. Okay, all that fun stuff, it costs money. And it's sad how many churches today are converting their churches from what was, you know, a decent church at one time to the fun center churches. And the reason they're able to do it, a lot of these churches, they've got, you know, these rich old people in the church. They've been going to that church, you know, since they got off the ark. And they're, they're not going to see that, they don't want to see that church die, but the church is dying out. There's nobody going to the church. How are we going to get somebody in? So they hire some hipster pastor that comes in and he talks them into bringing in all this fun stuff and they go along with it because it actually brings people in. But the thing they don't realize is now they're no longer a church. You know, they might as well just started a Chuck E. Cheese franchise, what they should have done. And, you know, the music's no different than what you hear at Chuck E. Cheese. You know, the, the preaching's no different. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's really a joke. And these, but these people, that's what people want today. What can I get out of that church? And we're not talking so much about the takers today. I want to mostly, I want to talk about being a giver and not an investor. Because we, and so we see a per person who's blessed. It's one who gives. And, you know, there are some people, they, you know, they're, they're looking for what can be done for me. They're not interested in serving. They're just looking to freeload. Those people hurt themselves. It is more blessed to give than to receive. The happier people are the ones who give, not the ones who come in and are just taking. But the givers, they're the ones they give of their time. They give their finances and they, they mostly just give their love. They love people. They love God. They love the things of God. They come in with an attitude of, you know, what can I do to help? They give expecting nothing in return, like, which is what the Bible teaches. And they just are usually the happiest people in the church. Just like it says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. But the investors, all right, who are those people? The investors, these are the people they give, and they often give well, but they give expecting something in return. They give with strings attached. And they, they often, these people are often a problem because they have high expectations, sometimes selfish expectations, and their gifts, so, you know, anything they do, their gifts they give, the work they do, there's always some string attached to it. And they often do great things for others, but then later it's like they send a bill for what they did. You know, they'll bring it up. You know, the past, you know, pastor does something they don't like in the church. Hey, pastor, remember when I did this for the church? You know, pastor, have you, have you noticed how much I give every week in the church? You know, 
And it's like they're, you know, it's time to collect, you know. And then, you know, then they, you know, hey, Pastor, why don't you back off on this doctrine, you know, and take it easy on this group or something like that, you know. And that, that often happens. And while many investors, they invest for good reasons, they're usually not as happy as the givers because I'm going to say something here that's going to sound mean, all right, but don't take this the wrong way. People are a poor investment. So, oh, no, there's nothing better we can invest in than people. Okay, that's true, but if, if you think like an investor, okay, when you invest something, what do you, you're, you invest hoping to get what you invested back and in then some, aren't you? And while people are a great thing, do you all understand that a lot of times people squander what they're given? That if you actually start doing the numbers, okay, when you, it, mathematically speaking, people are a poor investment. This is true. Most people that you do good to, you're not going to get anything in return. As a church, most people that we are, that we try to be a blessing to, that we try to help, we're not going to get anything in return. So mathematically speaking, we would call that a poor investment, wouldn't we? But at the same time, I do believe we ought to give to people. I believe we ought to follow the example that Jesus Christ gave. You know, he gave, God gave of his son. To the other. And it doesn't say he invested because if God would have invested in the world, it would have been a poor investment too. God gave his perfect, his holy, his righteous son, his only son. And look what he got in return. All right. And I hope you don't think you're a good inve- you're a return on the investment. We're not a good return on that investment. In fact, the only thing that's good about us is Jesus Christ who lives inside of us. The only thing that will ever be good about us is Jesus Christ. The only reason we'll ever be good enough to go to heaven is because He is going to change our vile body into one like His glorious body. So don't tell me that people are a good investment and use God as an example. We're a terrible investment. But God gave. God didn't invest. God gave to us. And thank God that He did. And we have benefited greatly from that. And He gave to us freely. He gave His Son freely. It was a you know, salvation. It is a free gift. And we have a God who gives and he gives things for, for, gives things for free. And I want to show you today that you should be a giver instead of an investor. A lot of times people say that, oh, we've invested in you. We've, we, you know, we've, we've done this for you. And they'll kind of hold these things over your head. And I've heard that term, invest, used a lot. And I don't think it means what it, act, you know, I don't think they're trying to say what they're actually saying when they say that. But sometimes they do. Some people, they are, they are investing. They're not giving. And that's not biblical. Luke chapter 6, verse 34 says, And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Listen, if you loan somebody something, if you lend somebody some money, you haven't done a good thing. The most crooked banker in town will lend somebody money, won't they? You, I mean, the most crooked place in town are some of these quick cash loan places. They will gladly lend you money. But are they doing it out of the goodness of their heart? No, they're doing it expecting something in return. They're expecting those massive interest payments. They want something from you, and so they will gladly lend to you, but there is nothing righteous about that. But God, Jesus said, when you lend, you lend hoping for nothing in return. Well, then that's not really lending, is it? No, actually, that's just called giving. And if people happen to give back, great. If they don't, oh, well. We ought to have the attitude, I'm just going to give I'm not going to lend. You know, he tells them, love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. It says, your reward shall be great and ye shall be the children of the highest. What does that mean? Is to be children of God's, we have to lend, hope for nothing again? No, what that's saying is, you know, that shows that you're a child of God because that's what God did for us, isn't it? God gave to us, hoping for nothing again. God gave to us freely. And so when we give to others, expecting nothing in return, Guess who we're acting like? We're acting like our father. Just like we do with our kids. When our kids do something good, you know, they're acting like their father. When they do something bad, you know, acting like their mother. You know, that, that's how, that, we, we've all played that game before. 
And whenever we do something like that, giving, expecting nothing in return, giving freely, we're like our father that's in heaven. And so he said, and that, and then the uh, verse 36, be ye therefore merciful. That's what it is to be merciful, to do good for someone who does not deserve it. And it says, do that as your father is merciful. That's what God does. He gives, he blesses, expecting nothing in return. That is called mercy. And that's what we need. That's what we ought to have in church. And just so some things you need to understand about giving and investing is the things of God are not to be made merchandise of. It says in John chapter 2, verse 13, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house, and house of merchandise. And I love this story. I just I can picture Jesus, you know, making that scourge of small cords, that whip, and just going and driving people out of there. He was angry because these were the things of God they were talking about. This this is the temple. Okay, and they were supposed to go and they're supposed to bring the sacrifices and things like that. But these people had found a way to market that. They found a way to capitalize on that, found a way how to make money, and they're in there completely misusing the things of God so they could profit from it. And that was not what it was all about. And this upset Jesus and he cleared them out. He ran them out of the temple and we are not to make things merchandise out of the things of God. Okay. And obviously we don't do the sacrifices and things like that today, but here we are in the house of God. You know, we, we serve God. We preach the word of God here. You know, we try to you know be a blessing to other people as a pastor, I want to be a blessing. I want to be a help. I want to be a minister to you. But I, we are not to use the things of the church as a way to try to make money and to score points. If we do that, it's going to get crooked every time. And we're going to start having the wrong motivations every time. And so when we're talking about investing, okay, that is one of the biggest ways to make merchandise of people. I mean, think about how many of us are owned by the banks and by bankers. And we can't do the things that we would like to do maybe because, you know, we are, we're owned. And it's the same thing in a lot of churches today. You know, if the church starts going the wrong direction and you want to change, you know, maybe you don't want to follow along. You're like, I need to move on. I need to go to another church or something like that. Don't you understand all that we've done for you? You know, we've got your kids you know, you've, they've got your kids in the school. They've got you, you know, tied up in like all these ministries in the church that aren't even biblical things. Right. And they, people are like, you know, they, they can't, they literally can't get away and they end up getting sucked down and going downhill with the rest of the church. And it's like, and they, they will hold these things over their head. We invested in you. Remember when I did this for you, you know, remember when I, and I mean, how would you all like it if every time you did something I didn't like. I just came along and I brought up everything I've ever done for you. Remember when I visited you in the hospital? I was there for an hour. You know, I, you know and then, you know, remember the time I came to your house, you know, and I, I've like kept track of all these things. And then I send you a letter. You know, you leave the church, get mad, and I send you a letter. All this for nothing. You know, you wasted my, t- you wasted my time. I invested and I got nothing in return. And listen, that's not going to make you feel good, but you know what? That's going to do. That's going to be a bad, give me a bad attitude too, isn't it? But the truth is, when we give expecting nothing in return, then when we get nothing in return, we're not disappointed, are we? But then if we do get something in return, hey, praise the Lord, thank God for that. And so I learned a long time ago. I mean, I was very early in the ministry. That I was like, I, I learned this principle that people are a bad investment. I refuse to invest in people. I would rather just give. I would just rather give, expecting nothing in return. And I didn't, even, I didn't even realize back then how biblical of a concept that was. That was just something I learned just from experience. I'm not going to waste my time investing in people. I would rather just give. Just, I'll give whatever I can, hoping for nothing in return. And, you know, I've enjoyed the ministry. 
I don't get up. You know, some preachers, every time you hear them preach, they're getting up and they're talking about all the people that have done them wrong. They're talking about all the time they've wasted on people. And this person did this to me and that person did that to me. And it's just like, good night. You know, if I were you, I'd get out of the ministry. You know, <laughs> if, I, you know if, because I mean, you're, you're a miserable person. And, but when you're, but givers aren't like that. Investors are like that. That's why if you've seen, you know, you hear these stories too about these people whenever the stock markets crash and things like that and they're they're like killing themselves and stuff and it's like first of all you people already still have a lot of money so why in the world are you killing yourself it's because they can't get over what they lost well you know what when the stock market crashed what was it 08 or whatever you didn't see me crying about it i didn't lose anything (laughs) you know and so uh you know i I went, I, I skated right through that thing like nothing. But these guys who had more than I will ever even think about having are like killing themselves, you know, taking drugs and things to deal with because they lost so much. Why? Because these guys, you know, they're investors and they just couldn't handle, you know, years of investing or whatever down the toilet. It just drove them nuts. But, you know, givers, they don't have that problem. But Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5, uh, we need to say the gifts of God are free. Okay, the things that God gives us, they are free. It says in Matthew ten five, these twelve, um, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, "Go not ye in the way of the Gentiles, and into any of the city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give." So Jesus is telling the disciples, hey, he gave them the power to go do all these miracles for these people. Do you know how easy it would have been for them to make merchandise out of that? To be able to heal somebody of leprosy? You could own that person to heal them of their leprosy, to be able to heal all these sick people. They could have been like Benny Hinn and they could have lived like Benny Hinn if they would have wanted to. They could Because their stuff they were doing was real too. But what did Jesus say? He said, freely you've received freely give he didn't want him taking the things of god he didn't want him taking the gifts of god and making merchandise out of them and understand the things that god gave us god gave them to us for free did he not he gave us these things freely he gave us the gift of salvation freely okay we're not going to go charge people for giving them the gospel you know we're not we're not going to do that that we got it for free and we're going to give it out for free that's just how these things are supposed to be done you know, and imagine, okay, and the things that we have, the things that, you know, the, the knowledge I have, the experience I have, any wisdom that I have, you know, it was something that was given to me. It was given to me freely. And I ought to give what I have to other people freely just as well. And imagine if one of you in here, you know, you gave me, you maybe, or you bought gifts for everyone in this church and you wanted me to give them out on Christmas, but you were going to be gone the Sunday before Christmas. And I went and I took all those gifts and instead of giving them to everybody in the church, I charged everybody in the church for them. <laughs> now, how would that make you feel if I did that? Something that you gave that you gave me to get freely, you gave it to me for free, to give to others for free, and then I took it and I made merchandise out of it and I charged people for it. You would say I was a crook. You would get very angry with me. And the things of God are things that have been given to us for free, and they are, and we are to continue giving them for free. All oh, you know, our forefathers, they they paid a price. You know, they did this, they. But no, listen, they got their things for free too. And you know, they yes, they pass things on to us. But these things are supposed to be done freely. And if we do, if we start charging, if we start making merchandise, that is wrong. That is wicked, and it's going to get crooked real fast. But turn over to Acts chapter eight. Acts chapter 8 and verse 14, we have a man, Simon, uh, who was a sorcerer who had gotten saved. And in verse 14, we'll start reading. It says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them to Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost, And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, 
he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Simon was a man who had power that was from the devil before. And he made money off of it. But then he ends up getting saved. He now no longer has that power from the devil. But then he sees these apostles who they have power from God. And so notice how Peter said you're in the gall of bitterness. What I think he's talking about here, I think Simon, he's like, you know what? I miss that money. I miss that income I was getting from that power that I had. And it was bothering him. You know, now I am. I'm serving God. Can't capitalize off, off this like I used to. But then he sees an opportunity when he sees the apostles laying hands on people and they're receiving the Holy Ghost, receiving the power of God. And he's like, I could capitalize off of that. And he's like, and so what does he do? He offers them money. Hey, give me that power. And he said, you know, he's like, how dare you even think that the gift of God may be purchased with money? And he cursed them, you know, thy money perish with thee. And of course, Simon, he's, you know, he's like, you know, please, you know, don't let this happen. The Bible doesn't tell us what happened to him after that. But I think he's a great example of many people in churches today. Yeah. It's like they're looking, you know, how can I capitalize on this? How can I, how can I profit from the things of God? And there's people that are figured out how to do it and are very successful at it, but it's not right. And so those who are ministered to, they should repay those who minister to them, but it's not something to be enforced. Okay. And in the Bible, you know, we, I'm going to show you some verse in this a little bit. We're not supposed to owe people. All right. Except to love one another. But we see examples where the Bible refers to us as debtors, which might look like a contradiction, but I'm going to show you what that's talking about. But we need to, but we got to understand that if somebody does something for you, okay, when it comes to spiritual things, you do owe them, but that person never has any right to try to enforce that on you and to uh, force collection on you. I'll show you some scriptures on that, but um, Romans chapter 15 Verse 25, it says, But now I go into Jerusalem to minister unto the saints, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and of Achaia to make certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. And it hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. So right here, we see Paul saying, Hey, you're debtors to these poor saints in Jerusalem. Why? Because they had given... And uh, you, you, you've, you've profited from their spiritual things. They should be able to benefit from your carnal things, okay? But here's the thing. Were those poor saints in Jerusalem trying to enforce it? He's just telling them, hey, this is the right thing to do. This is what you should do. And if somebody does something for you, if they help you, you should do something in return. That's just the right thing to do. But you never have the right to enforce that. A few more verses on that. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 11, it says, If we have sown unto you spiritual things... Is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. And we don't have time to read that whole passage, but that's Paul's referring to how it's okay to pay the preacher. That if he's sowing, you know, if he's ministering to you in spiritual things, it's a small thing if he reaps your carnal things. Other people use this power over you. Other people send you bills for services that they do. Now, he said, we don't use that power. Okay? So, once again, you should never get a bill from our church for anything that I do for you. If that ever starts happening, we got a problem. Okay? That, but that, that should not happen. But at the same time, if you are benefiting, it is, it's just the right thing for you to give back. Okay? You don't want to be the taker. You don't want to be the one who's just taking and never giving. You ought to give something back. But me as a pastor, I'm not going to do that. I, I'm not keeping track of who owes. and who. You know, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to give, I'm going to give, and I'm going to plow in hope. I'm going to plow hope, and I, I'm, I hope I receive something. 
I hope the church is able to take care of my needs, but I refuse to enforce it, and it would be wrong for me to enforce it, because once again, if we do that, it's going to be real easy for things to get crooked around here. And we don't want to do that. And so, uh, whenever you see those examples of you know, being debtors, okay, you know, if, said, if people are doing things, we should do it, but that is never, that's not going to be enforced, and we shouldn't enforce it. Uh, and also it says, um, well, turn over to 1 John chapter 4. So, you know, we don't pay back necessarily when it comes to you being owed, or if you owe somebody, okay? So let's say I do something good for you. I, I've, I've helped you out. I've been a blessing to you, okay? Because of what I have done for you, do you all now realize you are a debtor? But understand that debt isn't necessarily to me because yes, I did for you, but you know what? Somebody else did for me too. And somebody else had done for them. And if you trace it back, you know, it all goes back to God. But uh, look at what the Bible teaches. So how do we pay back our debts for those of us who are debtors? First John 4, 10 here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. Okay? It's perfected or it's completed. So what does that mean? It means God loved us and so we love him back. Is that what it's saying? No. God loved us who did not deserve any love, who were unworthy of love. If we love God back, it's not the same thing, is it? We should love God back, but do you understand if God loves us and we love him back, we didn't pay him back, did we? Because God is worthy of our love. God deserves our love. But if we, after we've been loved by God when we didn't deserve it, if we go and we show that same love to someone else, now we have, you can say, paid our debt. We have now completed the love of God. We perfected the love of God. God loved us and he wants us, not just to love him back, but he wants us to love one another. He wants to love those who don't deserve it. That's what it's talking about. And so, you know, an investor, they invest money in the company hoping to get their money back and hoping to get some extra. You know, investors who get poor returns usually have a bad attitude. And you know, the investor too, they don't really care necessarily what the company does as long as they get their money back. Okay? If you all are if you all invest money in stocks or mutual funds or 401k, I mean, most of you aren't checking up to make sure they're ethical, are they? What do you look at? You look at, do they get returns? Uh, that's, all, that's all we really care about. And that's all an investor does care about. You, know, they, you don't care if they rip somebody off, if they broke the rules. You're not even thinking about that. You just want a return on your investment. You want to go, if you contribute $1,000 to something, you want to go some months down the road and you want to see 1000 plus something. That's what you want to see. You don't really care what they did to get it. But you know, an inv a giver... He gives, hoping that what he gives will get passed on to someone else. And that's what God did for us. See, the thing we need to realize, giving doesn't start with us. It's like we think we're the origination of everything good. But it didn't originate with us. Okay, Goodness did not originate with you. you know, love did not originate with you. It all started from God. He was the one that originally started it. He was the one that loved us first. We love him because he first loved us. He started it and he wants us to pass it on to someone else. And so, you know, we were, he said, when it comes to the source of things, it all goes back to God. And it's amazing how many people we have in this country, you know, they're always expecting a handout. They're always expecting, you know, something from the government. They're always expecting money. But no, it's like, do they ever ask, hey, where did that money come from? It had to originate somewhere, didn't it? Well, it originated from somebody, you know, who gave. Somebody who produced something. And when it comes to the things we have, it's amazing, even in church, what people expect. You know, they expect, you know, a huge level of goodness. They even expect a huge level of of, you know, carnal things, you know, they want the greatest facilities. They want, like I said, they want all the fun stuff and they want everything free, but it's like, y'all understand somebody somewhere paid for that stuff. Somebody somewhere gave for that to happen. And it's, we don't often think about where did it start from, but when it comes down to it, when it comes to everything, 
It all starts from God. And who has ever paid God back for anything? Nobody's ever paid God back for anything. We can't pay God back. And He hasn't asked us to pay Him back. What has He asked us to do? He's asked us to take what He's given us and pass it along. But you know what a lot of people do? They take what they can from God and then it stops right there. And that's not what God wants. God wants it to be passed along. And so the truth is, you know, or, you know, we cannot possibly ever do more for anyone that's more than what God has done for us. Okay, well, and you might think, oh, I've done a lot for this person. Well, you haven't done as much for them as God's done for you. So you know what? Just keep giving. Just keep on being a blessing. Keep on being an encouragement. You can't outdo what God did for you. So don't think I've done enough and then back off. And the, so the truth is, our only debt that we should have, and Paul talked about Paul talked about being a debtor. The only debt that we have, it's a it's a love debt. All right, it's, it's a love debt. Look at what it says in Romans chapter thirteen, and verse eight. I'll turn over there, Romans chapter thirteen, and verse eight. It says, um, chapter twelve it says, "Owe no man anything." but to love one another. Now listen, if people, if we're investing in you, if as a pastor, I am investing in you, well, what does that mean? It means you owe me, doesn't it? You owe me, you know, depending on whatever I've invested in you. But the Bible says, owe no man anything, but to love one another. For, uh, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So you see right there that our, the only, you know, our debt that we have is to love others. Well, we got our love for free, didn't we? And we're supposed to give it to other people. That's how we fulfill the law. Romans chapter 8 and verse 12. It says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry... Abba Father. Y'all see how we're not debtors after the things of the flesh. Our only debt we have is a love debt. Okay? And understand that you you paying back a love debt, all right, it's something you want to do. Okay? We cry we cry out to God, Abba Father. Why? We have a closeness with Him. We love Him. The things that we do for God, we're not doing them out of debt because salvation was free. We're doing them out of love. That's what walking in the Spirit is. We're doing them out of love. Nobody in here, I doubt, I doubt anybody in here, how many in here you ever paid a credit card bill and you're just like, you know what, I just want to pay this because I just love that company. You know, I love J.P. Morgan Chase or, you know, Capital One or, or you, know, you don't do that. You do it because you have to. But understand, that's not what we do. We don't do the things that we do because we have to. We're saved. We're going to heaven whether we... Love God or we don't love God. We're going to heaven whether we do good or we don't do good. But when we do good, that's that fulfilling of the law. God loved us. You know, we're loving others. We're loving Him back. And we do these things because we want to, because we, we cry out to Father. We love Him. We have a closeness with Him. It says in chapter 1 and verse 14 of, of Romans, it says, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and and to the unwise, so as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Why did he owe them? Well, he owed them because he had the gospel. And he, that was given to him freely. And he's like, you know what? I'm a, he's basically saying, I'm a debtor to everybody. I'm a debtor to all men. You know what? I owe the whole world my love. And how do you show that love? The best way you can show your love is give them the gospel. That is the, the very next verse said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. This is what gets people saved. And so understand that you and I, we are debtors. We have a huge debt, but it's a love debt. And you know what? We should do the things that we do because we love. We ought to love people, and so we ought to want to give them the gospel. That's the best thing you can do. 
Understand that God loved me. God gave me salvation. I owe everybody. God loved me when I did not deserve it. And so, you know, I'm going to love other people. And the most loving thing you can do is give the gospel and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people. And so that's how we fulfill the, that's how we fulfill the love of God. And so our debt is one that can only be paid by someone who wants to pay it. Okay, turn over to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. So most of us, we pay our debts, but we don't want to pay them. If whoever you owe money to, if they called you tomorrow and said, listen, you don't have to pay your debt, you're not going to argue with them. You're going to say, thank you. I'll, I'll gladly skip that debt. But Galatians 5.13 says, For brethren... Ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not be consumed one of another. Okay, what we're supposed to do, we're called to liberty and we're supposed to love one another. Well, you, when you love, you don't have to be forced, do you? And understand that we do, we have a love debt. We've been commanded to love one another. Well, if I'm doing the things I'm supposed to do because I have to, then it's not because of love, is it? And I'm not fulfilling the love of God. If you're coming to church because like, this is what I have to do. Well, then you're not accomplishing anything. But if you're doing it because you love the Lord, if you're doing it because you want to, if you give because you love the Lord, because you want to, if you're doing good to other people because you love the Lord and because you want to, you are fulfilling the law. That is how you pay that debt. It is, it is one, when you do things out of love. And so you can't pay this debt that we have out of obligation. Well, I have to go soul winning because I'm a debtor to, to all men. No, that's not, how, that's not how it works. We're not doing these things. We've been called to liberty. And the fact that we don't have to do it, but we do it anyway, that is how we fulfill the love of God. And that's why it's so foolish to make it out like you've got to keep the law in one way or another in order to be saved. No, we're not debtors to the law. If we're debtors to the law, then we're required to keep the whole law. But the simple fact that we are saved without the works of the law, and then we go and we... Do those things anyway? What does that mean? It means we're doing them out of love. We read the Old Testament and we don't see it as this is what I have to do in order to go to heaven. We see that, you know what? Obviously, God's not pleased with this type of behavior. God obviously hates this. God obviously loves this. You know what? I'm going to read the Old Testament and I'm going to do what the Old Testament says because the Old Testament, it teaches me about God. It teaches me how he thinks about things. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to do those things. Not so I can go to heaven, but because I love God. And so people who don't understand God's love for us, they won't, they, they'll have no problem living you know, lives you know, just liberally giving you know, whenever they can to whoever they can. They're not going to live out of obligation. It's going to be out of love they're doing the things they do. They're going to give to others by faith. And when, they good, and when you do good in reality... You're doing it for Jesus Christ, aren't you? We're doing it for Jesus Christ. That's what it says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 17. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Let me ask you this. If Jesus, if you had you know, any business that you have, or if you had, a, let's say you owned a restaurant, and Jesus Christ himself came in and wanted a meal, how many of you would give him the bill? No, you're like, man, this is on the house. Right? And why would you? Because, man, it's a privilege to serve Jesus. It's a privilege to have you in my place of business. We will, you can have whatever you want in the menu no charge. That's a, none of us would give him the bill and expect a tip. We would be thrilled to serve him. But notice how Jesus said, I don't want you to, you know, and we would be, I mean, Lord, all you've done for me, you, know, you died for my sins, you saved me. All you've done for me, I want to give this back to you. Well, Jesus, he hasn't commanded us to give things back to him. 
Hey, he's saying, you know, that debt you owe me, you give it to someone else. That love you showed me, you show it to someone else. And the Bible says when we do it to others, we're doing it for him. So listen, why don't we take advantage of that? Do you realize that if you did that for Jesus, if, you know, by chance he decided to show up on earth, you did, I mean, it's, you could kind of say that would be selfish, wouldn't it? I mean, we'd all love to be able to brag about Jesus coming and visiting our restaurant, our place of business. You know, it would be something to make us look good, something we could, you know, it'd be good publicity for us. You know, it's not really going to impress him. Okay. He knows who he is. Okay. If the president showed up at your restaurant and you gave him a free meal, he's not going to be impressed. He knows he's the president. He knows he's a big deal. You know, and so the same, but at the same time, what is it that pleases God? It's when we have faith. Well, so now what if I have an opportunity to do something for someone who doesn't deserve it? Somebody who's not worthy, somebody who's not Jesus, and I do it for them anyway, I'm doing it just because he told me to do it. I'm doing it out of obedience. I'm doing it out of faith. And I believe when we do things for others, we are impressing Jesus Christ more than if we did it for him personally. If you wash the feet of someone else, it's more impressive than washing the feet of Jesus himself. We all would do that in a heartbeat. But when we do it for someone else, that's what shows that we have real faith. When we give expecting nothing in return. And I believe today what we need in churches, what God is looking for, is God's looking for givers, not investors. Determine, I'm going to be a giver. I'm not going to be an investor. I'm going to give and if my gift gets swatted, it gets wasted. Oh, well, we've all done that before. You gave something to somebody and what did they do? They wasted it. And we let it burn us up sometimes. Well, you know, if that's your attitude, you shouldn't have gave. We're supposed to give expecting nothing in return. And our reward will be great in heaven. We'll be the children of the highest. Why? Because we're doing what, that's what our father does. That's what he did for us. And that's what we ought to do for someone else. So be a giver not an investor. So with that, let's all stand together.